All right. Um, well, welcome. Well, it's about one minute after the hour, so we'll get kicked off. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and it's going to be posted to the OATS website and the YouTube channel for the benefit of everyone who couldn't make it here today. Um, but welcome to another Organic Advisor Call series call. I'm your facilitator, Nate Palpalm, and I'm the training specialist with OATS. This series is brought to you by OATS, the Organic Agronomy Training Service. And this is our eighth episode. So please visit the OATS website to view the calls that we've previously conducted. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend signing up for the newly launched Organic Advisor Listserv, and we'll be having some great conversations right in your inbox on all things related to advising organic grain farmers. The link to sign up is going to be in the chat. Please stick around after the show for some really exciting news and some announcements from Oats Programming. And that's pretty much it for housekeeping today. Um, my guest today is Megan Filbert, and Megan is a grazing expert previously with Practical Farmers of Iowa, and now doing some really awesome innovative work with No Fence. So we'll touch on, uh, on all of that as we go today. I'll get the conversation kicked off um, with a few questions for Megan. Please throw your own questions into the box and then I will have some questions for the audience to, to try to get some ideas flowing here. So Megan, could you give us a little intro on how you got into the grazing space and what your foray into organic and organic related field was? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm originally, I'm a native of Iowa and I had left Iowa for a while. I lived in upstate New York and worked within the New York City watershed where I learned all about water quality and how to combine that with working agriculture, specifically like medium-sized, small-sized dairy farms. And that area of New York is mountainous. And so these farms were grazing-based um, and grew some, some corn and soy. Um, but really, I saw the power of perennials um, and grazing and what it can do for water quality. And at the same time, I had been following Practical Farmers of Iowa and admiring them from afar and realized I would really like to go back to my home state of Iowa where there are pretty serious water quality issues and, and try to you know spearhead more livestock on the landscape and more grazing-based livestock and integration of livestock into cropping systems in the Midwest. So I came back to Iowa and the, the huge charge was cover crops. Mm -hmm. um, number one, to cover the soil, um, but, you know, ideally to, to help clean up our waters. Um, and it was a pretty hard sell to sell cover crops because of their expense to crop farmers. And I quickly went down the path of doing some on-farm research around the economics of grazing cover crops and many other people around the nation were kind of doing the same type of research and publishing case studies and you know over the last five to eight years it's become very apparent that the way to pay for cover crops is to add value through a ruminant and to graze them because they are directly offsetting the expense of hay and other winter feed. And I know farmers that were saving $40,000 a year in hay expenses, which is the number one expense of, of you know, a, a livestock operation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really how I got into the grazing space. Um, so it's, it's around grazing perennials and annuals. Um, but the easiest sell when we work within the corn belt is the grazing of cover crops kind of first and then we can talk about how do you potentially diversify rotations to add a small grain grace cover crops after a small grain or then you know implement a longer rotation with pasture or hay and eventually make your way to some sort of perennial and annual balance on the farm absolutely and and that was organic non-organic all of it Yes. All of the above. Yep. A few million acres we need to cover in Iowa to fix water quality issues. Yeah, so like 15 million. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Everybody. Um, so getting down to species then, when we're thinking about, we have corn soy rotations, um, maybe throw in a third crop for organic. Yeah. What cover crop species in your experience are good fits for grazing? I imagine there's going to be a range, some better for grazing than others. Yep, absolutely. So so truly the most forgiving um, species of cover crop and historically has been pretty affordable is just cereal rye, like mm. rye for whiskey rye. Um, and it just grows it, during cold temperatures. It starts to grow at like 35 degrees um, and it stays green long into the season. It's the first thing to grain up in the spring. And it's just, even if it's not ideal conditions when establishing it, it something will still come up. So it's just a really forgiving and like first cover crop you should try. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and it's, and it provides something to graze in Iowa, at least into December, potentially even January. And then again, it's the first to gr green up in the spring. So cattle could be on it in late March and April mm -hmm. before planting again. So that's number one. For grazing specifically, if you want more fall grazing, combine cereal rye with some oats, like half and half, um, because oats come up, oats as a cover crop are going to be like the first thing to put on biomass in the fall and um, provide a bunch of fall grazing. And then you can diversify from there and kind of make crazier mixes. And so depending on what you're grazing or yeah, what kind of feed stuff you want to provide, then that's where you could add different brassicas, turnips, grazing kale, radishes. Um, and, and then, you know, farmers, once they get comfortable with grazing between corn, corn and soybeans, then they feel a bit more confident to potentially plant a cover crop after a small grain in a diversified rotation scenario. And then that would be like a summer annual cover crop. That's like the base of that would be sorghum sedan grass. What sort of cleanup do you see folks needing to do post grazing? So as there, how much work or what, what, activities do you think a farmer should consider planning for in preparation for planting their cash crop after that grazing event? Yep. So, so obviously the, the, the biggest thing is that when I talk about grazing, I'm talking under the umbrella of making sure that your animals are well managed and they're not going to um, compact and, or, you know, pug up a field um, in one place. So, so that means, especially in the spring when it's wet, um, you definitely want to watch the forecast and move animals if you know there's a big rain event coming. So maybe if you're adjacent to a pasture, move them there. If not, is there a sacrifice area of one pasture where you could concentrate the animals during that rain event and before the, you know, while the, while the soil can dry back up again? just so you don't mess up the whole field. So that would be like the biggest piece of cleanup, right? Is like that there could be pugging around a field. And I know farmers who then it, it maybe isn't even that big of a deal because they plan to till before planting anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one way to clean up. Um, obviously in an organic system, so what's different in an organic system about cereal rye and grazing is that since cereal rye comes back in the spring, it has to be terminated. And, and grazing itself is not, I can't recommend it as a uh, complete way of termination, even if you mm -hmm. nubbed the rye down all the way to the ground. Grazing does stimulate plant growth. So that cereal rye will probably come back and could potentially cause issues in your cash crop. So, you know, very obviously, um, like conventional farmers, they're spraying it after grazing. So in an organic system, I would say graze cereal rye into the fall and winter and then let it grow up in the spring and crimp it. Okay. All right. Yep. So that's some cleanup. And or or um, if 
if you don't want to have to worry about spring termination and you're nervous about that, then plant oats that winter kill. Mm -hmm. And then you won't have grazing in the spring and you'll have to figure out a different feed to patch in in that early spring time before perennials are ready for grazing. Um, but that is an option and probably a nice way to, to dip your feet in hmm. um, to, uh, around grazing cover crops because you don't have to worry about that spring termination. So with so many things in American agriculture, there's a bit of bifurcation between crop farmers and livestock growers, at least in, in my experience yeah. that folks have, have kind of split. Um, if producers don't want to become ranchers or livestock raisers themselves, but want the benefit of grazing, could you talk a little bit about how we get folks together, folks with livestock, with folks with land, Absolutely. and what you see as a fruitful way to think about that relationship? Absolutely. So we, uh, at Practical Farmers Bio, we specifically uh, were getting calls about this exact thing. So, so you know, because the cover crop craze was, had come to Iowa and everybody's so excited about this lush um, cover crop that they can grow. Then they started thinking like, oh, it'd just be really nice if this could be put through an animal. It's, it's kind of not a waste, but you know, it could not be maximized. Waste. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting calls. Uh, hey, do you know of a grazer near me um, that could come bring their cows over here for a while or sheep. Um, and so I was doing this matchmaking a bunch, um, just through like racking my brain through the people that I knew that spearheaded, um, a group of grazing experts in the upper Midwest to put together a matchmaking service called the Midwest grazing exchange. Um, and Nate, you could pull that up and potentially put that in the chat, the MidwestGrazingExchange.com. Sure. Yeah. And so that is a place to specifically match make. We call it Tinder for Cows. Um, it's a, a, a place where you could find, grazers could find land for grazing and vice versa. Row crop farmers and cover croppers could find animals that could be brought into their land for grazing and thus fertility and you know, hopefully to improve and enhance soil health. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know where all of you are located, but so that's the Midwest exchange, but there is an exchange in California called match.graze. There's an exchange in the mountain West, the Ma mountain West grazing exchange, I believe is the name of it. Um, there's other exchanges popping up. There's a South Dakota and Minnesota grazing exchange. So the idea is certainly um, always been there. It's catching on now in the form of these matchmaking websites instead of just, you know, who do you know and where, you know, word of mouth type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's that's one way to do it. What, um, what do you see as um, the, the, there's probably a range of, of monetary relationships well, with rent or, or fees. Um, what do you, how, what have you seen work best? What should farmers think about when they're thinking about how do I get someone to bring animals on my land? Yep. So there are many different ways that this can look. There are some resources out there to specifically help guide you through that or guide you through, um, the conversation and the, the potential lease or contract that you enter with the, the partner. Um, but I will say that a lot of times um, there are predominantly farmers are, so a grazing and row crop <clears throat> pair are splitting the cost of cover crop and establishment 50, 50. Okay. So, um, and, and both parties seem to be happy with that. The grazer is then responsible for uh, fencing, water, you know, check it on the cows. So, so besides the, the half of the cover crop cost and potentially establishing it, the row cropper isn't responsible. Mm -hmm. Um, I know of other row crop grazer pairs where the row cropper is very much into soil health, understands the benefits, 
the plethora of benefits that come from integrating livestock and they pay for the cover crops. Maybe mm-hmm. they were paying for cover crops anyway mm-hmm. out of their own pocket. And they say, we, yeah, we don't need any monetary exchange. I know of other folks that are, um, I know of livestock farmers that are paying the row cropper for the forage, mm-hmm. you know, potentially at the tune of a dollar or a dollar 25 per head per day. Mm-hmm. Um, I know of other grazers who have argued that the benefits that livestock bring are numerous and they're just harder to quantify. Mm-hmm. And so the some grazers believe they should be paid um, potentially by the row cropper. So, you know, it also, it also can mimic um, what you, what a grazer might pay for corn stocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's a, that could be a baseline and you could add on to that. Sure. Um, it just totally depends on what's available in the field, how uh, much work it is for the grazer mm-hmm. um, and what you feel comfortable and can agree to with your grazing partner. So again, there are some resources out there. Um, I'll try to find those while we're on this call and chat them, but Great. there's some, yeah, there's some, there are base, bases out there to build your contract. And I think you had shared with me a really great fact sheet that I'll throw into yes, the chat. Yes, please do. Um, that uh, kind of covers some of this as well. Um, and thinking about that infrastructure. So we've got animals who have been off yep. the farm for 30, 40, 50 years. What should uh, interested row crop farmers who are wanting to bring animals back, maybe not for themselves, but as part of their rotation, what are those essential infrastructure items that every farm needs to have to consider yep. bringing animals on? Yep. So just the very basics is f- fence, some form of containment, and a water source. Um, and so ideally, you're, a row crop farmer is going to want to work with um, a, a grazer who has animals that are trained to electric fence, and ideally like one to two strand of electric fence. And most likely the grazer is going to be the one that's willing to be responsible for that, especially if it's just one strand of poly wire Mm -hmm. to keep animals in. That's, that's just not very labor intensive or expensive to um, set up. Yeah. It's just a very temporary situation, which works really well when we're talking about grazing cover crops, because I don't know, you might graze a field for two weeks, maybe a month at max right in the mm-hmm. fall and or the spring or just one of those seasons so it's just it, it it's nice to be able to match a temporary infrastructure with a temporary practice yep and not have to sink any anything more into that um so water becomes an issue in the winter obviously if if you're really doing this during the the cold of winter mm-hmm. um i mean most of the time in the shoulders of the winter season farmers are bringing a water wagon over mm-hmm. but Um, sometimes you can fence in a Creek if the Creek is runs you around. Um, sometimes I know of grazers who have tapped into a a nearby house and used their water line, Mm -hmm. um, with permission and sometimes pay them some money that, you know, cause they'll be charged on a water bill. There's different ways to work that out as well. Um, also remember, I I mean, I'm not going to like fully recommend this all winter long, but remember that cows cows and rumen all ruminants can eat some snow if you're in a really rural place without any water and you get a big fresh snowfall they will eat snow we've seen videos of it um also snow insulates the cover crop and helps keep it green and it and then helping it retain some moisture so water is critical obviously but there are some ways just to some things to consider um, and some ways around that to get creative. What challenges have you run into with folks bringing animals on for the first time and then maybe getting soured on it? Like, what is what? How does this relationship go wrong, and how do we avoid those pitfalls? Um, I would say that relationships go wrong when 
there's poor communication involved. It just takes really solid, open communication. Everybody knows that animals can potentially get out and that it's just a fact of life that it happens sometimes. So as long as, let's just say, hypothetically, the row crop farmer sees the cows out and can call the grazer and get a response right away and get that grazer there, or, or the grazer has someone in line to come help right away and is responsive to that, that's what matters. Um, what else? I guess um, it's really good to have the plan of wh what you're going to do with a rain event and where the animals are, you know, can go for the time being temporarily. And two, when you need to have the animals off the field in the spring because the farmer wants to come in and plant. So like have those deadlines and those plans in place at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So you know what to expect in the spring, because like I, I know of situations where um, there's been lack of communication around when the farmer is going to come plant in the spring. Uh, it's really weather dependent. It's kind of at a drop of a hat. And then you're asking, um, you know, you might be asking the grazer to pull up all the fence and get the cows off within a day's time. And it, it it kind of causes a cluster for everyone and some frustration. So again, I, I think it just totally comes down to communication. Yeah. In thinking about, uh, you had mentioned that the grazer could be responsible for the fence. Is yeah. that responsible for the whole whole shebang where they would pay for the materials, do all the installation? Or do you see more of a balance in there where there's yeah. some sort of permanent infrastructure? I think there could be a balance, especially in a place where there's already something yeah, some sort of fence in place already. So, mm -hmm. so maybe the grazer um, relies on that perimeter fence and brings in some temporary cross fencing for mm -hmm. to make some paddock divisions and 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 rotate their animals through the cover crops. Um, there certainly might be cases where a row crop farmer uh, grew up raising livestock, is comfortable around livestock, and says, "I'll take," you know, we will create a monetary arrangement that pays me for my time in also looking after the, the animals because this is my home farm or what, whatever it may be. So there are certainly different ways to figure out that scenario and what's fair for both parties. It's just totally dependent on what each person's willing to do and what existing infrastructure is already there. Sure. Yeah. Yep. In kind of zooming out to sort of this landscape question of 15 million acres needing some cover crops and some animals on them, um, or many, many more if we look through the whole country, what do you see as the, how do we scale this? What do you see it as, you know, 18 foot horse trailers with a few cows dotting the landscape, or do you see semis moving across taking pot loads of cows onto larger acreages? Well, I, I, I would love to see more crop farms actually have resident livestock and, and, mm -hmm. and ra raise livestock. And, and, you know, I understand why that's not the case. Uh, so many of these farmers raised livestock throughout their childhood and just don't, they're older now and they don't want to mess with raising something 365 days a year. So we also see these like budding entrepreneurial custom grazing businesses popping up, which is proving to be like pretty viable enterprise, especially for beginning farmers who land access is their number one barrier, right? Mm -hmm. And they can't afford to buy land. They might have a home base, but they, they don't, they can't afford to buy a ton of land and they just don't have the grazing resources that they wish they had. And then thus comes in this idea of trucking your animals to different places within a radius you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So I will say that when I have talked to I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crop farmers about like, what would it take to integrate livestock um, and graze your cover crops? They, no, the number one excuse I've gotten over the last 10 years is fence. I don't mm. have any fence. I tore it out years ago to make way for my crops and for bigger equipment and, or the fence I do have is in disrepair. It's not worth it. And, and also pair that with inflation and what we're dealing with right now and fence materials are just like astronomical 
Um, So that leads into a little bit of why I transitioned from Practical Farmers of Iowa to my new job with no fence. I work for a virtual fencing company um, and virtual fencing is a real technology that is coming to the United States now. Um, It's where animals wear, cattle, sheep, or goats wear a GPS collar. It looks like a cowbell that dangles on their neck with a chain and you set the virtual boundary from your phone and they, when they approach that boundary, there's a set of audio cues that plays followed by an electrical pulse if they continue to go towards the boundary you've set. And um, it absolutely works. Um, And I just feel as though virtual fence, like custom grazing herds with virtual fence collars, um, it opens up so much possibility because you're saving on the materials and the labor of fencing. Um, And I feel as though it's an answer to being able to graze millions, millions more acres of, of cover crops. And we know that farmers are, I've surveyed 600 cattlemen about this and 95% of name, 98% of them said that they would plant more cover crops if those cover crops could be grazed because Mm -hmm. that's, what's going to help pay for them. And, and the number one barrier is because those fields aren't fenced. So, um, I just feel as though if we could pair virtual fence technology with maybe some better, you know, I don't want to have to rely on handouts, but like some better incentives for planting and or grazing cover crops. There's incentives for planting cover crops, not as much for grazing cover crops, Mm -hmm. um, that that could be a winning combination. I love that idea. Could you talk a little bit more on the tech side? I'm glad you brought up no fence and virtual fence. Um, So my understanding is um, it's sort of like a a, a multi-tiered shock collar um, for a dog, not to not to put any bad uh, connotations with it. Um, But in thinking about like training cows and thinking about how we get the nation's cattle herd to be prepared to, you know, be responsive and understand what this is. Could you talk a little bit about what it takes to get that, um, get to that point with cattle so that they're not a hazard of running across the barrier? Yes, absolutely. So, so the actual training process um, is is actually very simple. The animals learn the system quicker than the farmer learns how to use the app. Um, so it so training of the animals takes like three to five days, um, and we say wait at least a week before you uh, take animals to an area where they're only using a virtual boundary. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so training essentially is. You, you're, you have your animals in, in a pasture they're familiar with, your home pastures, and you set up a physical boundary like you normally would. And one, so it's a four-sided boundary and one of those sides you would bring in and make virtual. So they can start to get used to just one side virtual, three sides physical. Eventually mm-hmm. you can make two sides virtual, two sides physical. And then after about five to seven days, you could potentially be using only virtual as your boundary. I will say that um, that virtual fencing was not invented to necessarily replace perimeter fencing. That's not what mm-hmm. it's for. It's it's to it's to take the place of interior fencing so we can get more rotations uh, out with the animals without having to use the labor. So, I mean, you could be moving your animals, you could be rot- rotating them every 10 minutes if you wanted to with, with this technology. Um, so I will also say though, um, there are plenty of scenarios where it's just in the middle of nowhere, not around busy roadways at all, not much liability if they were, if animals were to get out. Um, especially like with goats and targeted grazing where they're eating invasive species in Mm -hmm. far to reach places. Yeah. That is when virtual fencing is used as a perimeter. Mm -hmm. Um, And so a little bit about if animals escape. So 
So like I said, animals d are, are receive an audible cue. It kind of sounds like beep, 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 beep. And at the highest pitch beep, if they make it that far, because if they turn around it, the sound turns off. Mm -hmm. So if they make it to the highest pitch, like they're really reaching for that, that, that blade of green grass, they will receive an electrical pulse. Um, it's three kilovolts, so that's pretty light, but it's effective because it's through the chain that's it made, it's directly in contact with their neck in many places. So it doesn't need to be any hotter than that. Um, so if they actually are to escape, let's say a cow, a herd is spooked, a um, predator, a dog, whatever that might look like, um, they will go through the, the audible tones plus electrical pulse three times. And then that constitutes as an escape and you're notified on your phone immediately when there's an escape, you're notified on your phone when there's a, a, a even any sort of shock. Like I got one while we were on this webinar, uh, electrical pulse for number 2060. So and that, that's um, the individual animal ID. Correct. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in real time, you know, who's getting shocked. So the other thing is if an animal gets out, and it constitutes as an escape. This technology relies on, relies on herd behavior. We want, we hope that that animal or that group of animals wants to return to its herd based mm -hmm. on herd instinct. And most of the time within five to 10 minutes, it will. Yep. The other thing is at any time you open your app and you see where every single caller is because it's GPS. So you know where your animals are at all times. The callers report to the app every 15 minutes. So you have these timestamp GPS timestamps. Um, you can look at, you can track where they've spent the most time the last 24 hours in the last week through heat maps. Um, so there's quite a lot of data you can look at. And if an animal were to escape, let's just say your whole herd gets out because they're being chased by predators, you can still GPS them and yeah. go find them, which is a huge a huge upgrade huge to advantage. what we have today I oh mean, my god today gosh. it's like the neighbors are knocking on your door or the sheriff yep. is knocking on your door or something like that so so there at least is that you're sort of blowing <laughs> all of blowing my mind as far as my 14 year old brain who is first getting into agriculture running electric fences and then exactly. getting those calls and having to figure out exactly. how to find out the spot. This is uh -huh. great. <laughs> um, <laughs> could have saved a lot of labor and grown a lot faster if that wasn't mm -hmm. all I was doing. In thinking about um, adoption, what is, uh, what's the barrier do you think to, to no fence or virtual fences um, becoming really widely used really quickly? Yep. Okay. So uh, it's price. Um, so collars, cattle collars cost $300 each okay. and sheep and goat collars cost $200 each. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, for smaller scale operations, that's maybe doable, but when you start talking about larger herds, right, we're talking hundreds, maybe thousands, then how are you supposed to pay for it? So we recommend that every adult animal wears a collar. And that recommendation is based on research for maximum containment, like best, you know, most efficient and effective containment. Um, and uh, producers always ask me, does every, does every animal have to wear a collar? And what I say is that like every herd behaves differently and every individual within a herd behaves differently and you may have animals within your herd that never test a boundary they're not you know they're 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 complacent they're not trying to, they're not getting shocked they're never the ones getting shocked and mm -hmm. probably those animals won't need a collar mm -hmm. um but we do know that at least 51 percent of your herd needs a collar because we don't want half of the herd drawing the other half out of the invisible virtual boundary. And then right. that becomes an animal welfare issue with animals getting shocks, um, undue shocks and being very confused. So in the future, could you play with different ratios of 80% collared, 20% not potentially? It just totally depends on your herd. Mm -hmm. At this point where we're at is these collars 
are not available yet in the U.S. They're, they will become commercially available in mid-2023, so next summer. And right now we're initiating 75 pilot projects around the country, and we're asking this question of our pilot farmers. Um, so in we'll, thinking we'll, we'll about... The, the uh, super exciting and thinking about a, a farm that's in a, a somewhat normal rural but normal area as far as development roads we should expect to have one or two strands of wire around the whole perimeter and then manage that interior paddock grazing with virtual fence sort of best case scenario absolutely absolutely um, so we shouldn't think about keeping animals off roads with virtual fence necessarily still have a piece of wire there Correct. But interior management, awesome. C correct. And again, like that, that is up to your comfort level. That's up to you. You know your, you know what you're comfortable with and what your cows will obey. Um, but just know that because there's no physical boundary, that there is a chance that they could escape. But mm -hmm. the thing is, if there was a uh, trigger to spook animals with one polywire, they can escape too. It, right. You know, it yeah. so no no fencing containment scenario is flawless. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's just very interesting that now with with virtual fencing technology, we're just we're not talking about physical containment anymore. We're talking about a it's a, it's a, it's mental actually. It's, it's like Pavlov's response. You know, you're training these animals mentally and using an, unlocking animal behavior for them to know what a, an audible cue means and what mm -hmm. repercussions it brings. So it's actually a completely different way of containment. And, uh, you know, I like to use goats as an example, like the old saying is if a fence can't hold water, it can't hold goats. Mm -hmm. And like people can't believe that virtual fencing works on goats. Well, the ruminants it works on it mentally, it's doing the same exact thing on goats than it is with every other ruminant. And so it, it, it actually works. It's like the first time in history we have something that really truly works for, for goats. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Um, in thinking about uh, getting, getting, um, producers, uh, getting custom grazers to be more attractive to row crop farmers. Would you say that um, as part of that young entrepreneurial business, if a young grazer or a new grazer bought a no-till drill and said, the second you're done with harvest, I come in, I drill it all in um, and I take over. Is that something that might be more of that yes, this is so not a headache for me, don't worry about it? Or do you think that's not quite, not quite necessary? No, Nate, I, I love that idea. And I've heard, I've heard of people doing that. Actually, I, I know of a grazer in Southeast Iowa who has a no-till drill and he's the one that he, the farmer says, go for it. There's my field. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm harvesting this day. And he hops in his no-till drill and follows the combine and drills in his forage, basically. Yeah. And it works for them. It works really well. I mean, they're neighbors, so that helps. I have often dreamed of like, what if the local co-ops offered a soil health package and sold this to row crop farmers? And that soil health package mm -hmm. was, was, was the cover crop seed, the establishment of it. They'll come, someone comes in and drills it for you. And then also you could add on to that soil health package, having grazing livestock you call and they're there within three days or something like what if we could just turn that into a whole like suite of yeah just a whole like kit or you know something Absolutely. you could order yeah. yeah yeah so i think that custom we, we know that um especially in iowa probably other states there's a lot of like um cover crop custom seeders like that's a big business that's popping up mm -hmm. um they go around the state they 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 have they deal the cover crops they're your dealer and they come in and 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 plant them for you right i think that those companies should add on the livestock piece yeah and as whether that's contracting out with the grazers they know or they have animals themselves i don't know what that will look like but it would be really cool to just have that be an add-on practice 
do you have a stage of life, say in, in cattle, that you think they're just like the best custom grazers, like yearlings or mama cows who have just gotten their calves weaned off that just are much easier to manage? That's a good question. I, I mean, I think that, I mean, so many farmers that I have worked with are grazing gestating cows and, mm -hmm. and, and mama cows that have with calves that have just been weaned. Mm -hmm. Um, just, you know, they're docile. And, um, I mean, I also know of farmers that are specific, they raise up backgrounders to then put in their feedlot and those backgrounders are thriving on cover crops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think those two classes of animals, absolutely. For everyone in the, in the audience, um, if you have any specific questions for Megan, please un unmute and ask as well. Um, one question I posed to the audience is for you as farmers or as consultants to farmers, um, what do you think the barriers are to convince your farmers to try out custom grazing? What, uh, what skepticisms or, or questions might you have? And to get it kicked off, I would push that to Michael O'Donnell. Um, if you have any thoughts on on how to integrate livestock or what questions you'd have to integrate livestock on the farms you work with in Indiana, would love to hear them, not to I'm, put you on the spot. I'm very interested in these answers. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have an answer. I mean, this, this interests me in the farm that I work closely with um, or work directly with um, in Northwest Indiana. You know, we've talked about this and the farm owner knows the value, but we're in a place where the only livestock is confinement, um, large confinement systems. You know, there's a bunch of bunch of big dairies to the north in Jasper County, you know, Fair Oaks land. Yeah. And uh, there's several confinement hog operations. Um, you know, a few people with with small um uh, you know, personal herds of, of of beef or whatever, but you know, they're not interested in moving them around and in terms of having meaningful impact on the the land that we're we're operating on, you know, it's like, okay, we could we could get like one 80 acre field in the 4,000 acre operation with some livestock impact, which which is better than nothing. And it's a start. But yeah, um, yeah that trying to make that happen is a little tricky without thinking about do we develop our own enterprise internally, which right now with everything else going on with the operation, you know, it's out of the question because we're yeah. already short on labor and operationally trying to execute. Um, so it's, so yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I've, I see it with some farms where they're, where they've, um, here in Indiana, some farms that have, that have expanded their own operation, their own um, cattle operations and made the investments to have integration across landscape, across the you know, the land that they farm extensively. Um, and it's neat to see that, you know, that they've made, you know, forage uh, a critical part of the rotation. Um, haven't seen the no fence piece, probably would have made made it easier for some of these farms that have made some, some pretty hefty capital investments in, um, in fence, but, um, well, how would you but putting collars on putting collars on four hundred on three to four hundred animals would also not be right. <laughs> yeah. How so would you I, I don't know another another thing I've I've heard is some people who have, um, you know, worked on this and had some some acres custom grazed, um, have seen negative impacts on their subsequent. Um, yield in row crops and again that could come down to management and other factors but um definitely heard some people gripe about that so there seems to be kind of mixed mixed um experiences definitely comes down to management um i will also say in regards to dairy i know that in wisconsin there's more and more folks that are deciding to graze their confinement dairies, but they're deciding to graze their heifers on cover crops. And they might be, you know, they're sending their heifers away to do that somewhere else. But that, you know, that's a start. That's a baby step. What is your current uh, fence infrastructure, Michael? 
What would need to be done there? Uh, the farm I work with in Walkett, uh, zero, zero, okay. fence, zero fence. I mean, this is this is an area that, you know, it's not fence row to fence row. It's it's, you know, th there's no fence left anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Landscape. I mean, this is this is flat black territory. Windmills, corn, soybeans, uh, uh, seed corn. You know, kind of area. You know, so this operation that's that I work with that's got, you know, eight to nine crops and cover crops in rotation is definitely the oddball um, mm. in the area. Mm. I, I do want to make one more point to um, the fence investment piece. Obviously, we just have to do the math for each scenario, but, um, you know, it when you're investing in the collars, you're not investing in fence that's only in one place that's stationary, right? Like the, these cows yeah. with these collars can go, it's like you're fencing in 10 fields maybe, right? So so you do have to just think about the spreading those costs over acres. That's yeah. a great way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to per animal basis on a per farm basis. Correct. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's a lot of potential, you know, like any farm that's on several thousand acres, a lot of the fields are spread out and thinking about grazing some of those would be a, a big challenge because yeah. some of them are quite isolated and thinking about how to get water on some of these farms would just be, would just be a lot. But, mm -hmm. but about, two, you know, about 2000 acres of this farm is more or less contiguous. Um, Which is also so, a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, and contiguous to the home farm, yeah. you know, <clears throat> where water could be, you know, where there's a couple different wells and water could be integrated then across that contiguous acreage that's the, the majority of which is is owned. So the potential's there in terms of having contiguous land and at least from the home farm access to water that could be pushed out. Um, but there's, you know, again, no fence, but on that land, it would, you know, you could cover a pretty good swath with just exterior you know perimeter mm -hmm. fencing and then you know you're subdividing from there using virtual you know if we if, if you were to go that direction but again it's for this operation right now thinking about developing cattle enterprise inter internally is is not in the near term but it, it, uh, but, but yes it, it, reaching back out to the dairies could be interesting but um there's some challenges there <laughs> Do you think, Michael, if you were approached by someone who said, you know, as soon as harvest is over, I'll take over, I'll put in that single strand of electric around the outside edge and manage that that would be something that oh, you it, would, it, it, folks it, could it, oh, it would definitely, it would definitely interest because something we like to do in rotation is have a full year um, of, um, you know, cover crop. But when we're just cropping, Amazing. it's pretty hard to justify. We did that in transition years on fields over time but then trying to maintain that um is, is tricky so yeah if someone approached us and seemed like a good manager and seemed like a good potential you know business partner um uh, it's definitely something that we would consider oh yeah michael at where exactly are you located or this farm you're talking about white county so that's northern do you say northern illinois yeah, it's like halfway between Indianapolis and Chicago. Okay. Not far off of Interstate 65. Okay. Oh. Awesome. It's exciting All to right. think about. Yeah. Um, that single strand of, of electric, keeping it in, I think um, we had a really bad drought last year in Montana. And, um, and there's just no hay, like many, and it's just yeah. kind of across the greater West. A lot of cows were liquidated. A lot of cows moved off ranches. Um, so I was always interested in seeing how quickly a single strand of fence went up around pivots that just watered up whatever would grow there after mm. harvest and cows came on. And it was surprisingly quick um, how easy it was to do after years of these hemming and hawing from folks saying that they didn't want any livestock. And so when the moment struck, it seemed like it was actually very easy to do. Um, and just took some some good post pounders, putting in those corner posts, and then getting the perimeter fences. 
but yeah, I, I, I love that. And as a thought for, you know, what to, what to ask for about organic transition money going to, if there was more infrastructure in that space for, um, livestock fencing, it seems like that's is really right for development. Um, Bridget, I see you on. Did you have any questions uh, for Megan about any of the folks that you're advising as part of your consulting? Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. This is my first organic advisor call. I just was kind of joining to get a lay of the land. Um, and I'd, I'd love for our, our agronomist consultants to be here next time to be able to, you know, I haven't worked with anybody um, just yet in my time here. Who I who I feel like um, would be a right fit for this, but yeah, yeah, thank you. It was really helpful to just get exposed. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us. Yes. What um for what would you how would you describe the characteristics of the entrepreneurs you've seen in this space so far, Megan, who have started these custom grazing operations? <laughs> Excuse me. One second. No, all good. Ah, okay. Um, most of the farmers, like I had mentioned, are young and, and beginning farmers <laughs> who are um, who are looking for land. Um, you know, they um, one specific farmer I'm thinking of, he houses his livestock, like their home base is his grandma's farm, but he's essentially taking I mean this is specific to goats but he's taking his animals within like a 200 mile radius around central Iowa um and grazing all kinds of different scenarios um so and the other kind of piece to think about with this custom grazing operation is that there's not a ton of infrastructure you need to get started I mean you can start with like a used truck and a used trailer um, and, um, and then of course the, the physical fencing infrastructure that you might need and, and a mobile water tank. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, like, yeah, so pretty much everyone that I'm talking about is, um, would probably be classified as a beginning farmer, you know, farming for 10 years or la less mm -hmm. because they, they just really want to farm and they feel as though livestock is, um, the best opportunity to do so, you know, like they are not necessarily interested in row cropping or they don't have the capital to be able to start, yeah. um, with any sort of grain infrastructure, um, or the, or the land base, obviously. Right. Um, and so it, it just the low, the, the comparatively low upfront investments, and the potential that's pretty great and growing is attractive. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like, you know, I just want to mention, I know it's probably not super applicable to everyone on the call, but like a couple different ways that contract grazing is becoming really hot um, and more and more people are jumping on this is because of solar grazing, which mm -hmm. we're going to see, you know, millions and millions more acres of solar panels in the Midwest in the next decade. Yep. Um, so solar grazing, and that's suited to sheep um, and because, because agrovoltaics and grazing under solar panels is truly catching on now um, mm -hmm. because, you know, all of this pushback uh, around taking agriculture land and putting in solar. We need, we need it to be dual or triple purpose. Right. Okay, so solar grazing is, is, is just taking off, but also we see from the West um, grazing for wildfire suppression, mm -hmm, using mm -hmm. goats or sheep for it, potentially even cattle for wildfire suppression, and that's through co custom grazing outfits. So those are just two different little niches that are probably not going to be little for much longer. Like they're really gaining um, and responding to an immediate need. In our country. Yeah, 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 love that. Um, looking to mid twenty twenty three, when no fence does become yeah. available in the states, how do folks um, interested find out more and and get well, on the wait let list? Let me let me link to the no fence site, 
Okay. And within that site there, right when you click on it, you'll see a register your interest button or potentially scroll down and see the register your interest. And if you are would like to register your interest, then you'll be added to our marketing emails. And that's where we will be letting everyone know when it we open for commercial sales. Um, there's also drop down menus on the website for every country um, that we're in. And you could press on the United States uh, landing page and it's not filled out yet but we're working on that now around fleshing that out with all of the upcoming events in the u.s um a map of the pilot projects and then again went commercial sales information awesome. so just yeah register your interest follow along that's the website we have one last question for you from Margaret, um, who asked, uh, what's the relationship between cattle and solar grazing? Yeah, so Margaret, what I know about that is that currently, as solar arrays are are put up and created, um, they're not conducive. Not many of them are conducive to cattle because of the height of the array, which is like three feet off the ground. And yeah, cattle would be too destructive. I have heard, and, and and goats would also be too destructive because they'd be jumping on things potentially, right? So sheep are kind of like the best suited species, ruminant species for solar farms now. I have heard that they there are other forms of solar arrays um, being experimented with that are like hardier or higher up off the ground that potentially cattle could be put in in the future. So we just kind of have to watch and see how that plays out. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you for all the info, Megan. Thank you for Absolutely. joining us today. This was so great. I knew it would be, but I'm really, really pleased that folks were able to listen to this conversation and we'll have it up on the OATS page. Um, throughout this series, I've been announcing at the end of the call that we have some exciting things and OATS is live with the hybrid course. And so we'll stick that uh, sign up. If you have anyone who's interested in taking it, please um look look here and um and lastly we're going to have two more of these before the end of the year so we're going to have links sent out for our november and december session um any any closing tidbits for us megan that you you'd like to i just added with? my contact information in the chat you're welcome to contact me not just about virtual fencing but about cover crops and grazing fantastic um, Yep, that's really my passion. And I just want to thank uh, Steve Riggins for connecting us. And uh, thank you for inviting me on today, Nate. Yes, thank you for your time. This was really exciting and uh, excited to see millions more acres grazed. Yay. So all together. All right, take care, everybody, and thank you. Bye. Bye.